happen to be home checking out a Grow and Lead webinar. This is our February session of the 2020 UP Nonprofit Conference Recalibrated. I am Karen Wolf, uh, also known as Wolfie to those of you who know me, and I'm an associate with Grow and Lead. We will be hosting monthly webinars through June, and we invite you to join us. Um, our thanks to the Nonprofit Network for their sponsorship of tonight's events. For Grow and Lead members, we will be hosting follow-up member masterminds to review what we've learned with our nonprofit peers. Tonight's session will be recorded and we will send out a link and a PDF of the slides. And I'm watching, it looks like we've got about half of the people in, so I'm gonna hold off for a second. And, um, but Katina has a lot of ground to cover. And um, I'm very pleased to introduce Katina Kane, nonprofit network consultant. And uh, she is going to present tonight on embracing the power of a diverse and inclusive workplace. Katina, I'd like to hand the controls over to you. Thanks so much, Wolfie. I am so excited to be here with you all today. I am here to present a topic that is so near and dear to my heart and to the work that I do as a consultant. I serve as a consultant with Nonprofit Network and we do um, capacity building work across the state. And this is my area of expertise. I absolutely love this work. I'm also a certified Bridges Out of Poverty trainer. If you all have heard about Bridges Out of Poverty, we do that as well. But this is such important work, especially in the landscape that we are in today. These are conversations that we, as, our, as organizations, we need to be having. We need to be having these conversations as individuals. And so today, we're going to be creating this space for reflection and discussion about diversity, inclusion, and equity. So I know um, many of you have been using Zoom for probably about the past 12 months now. And so here's just some Zoom features we're using. We're going to be using the Q&A box. So please feel free to type your questions there. We will get a chance at the very end to uh, answer some of those. Also, um, we have a chat box to connect as well. And then please you use the raise your hand feature. If you have any technical difficulties that jump up during this session, we will do our best to help manage those with you. So our training objectives today is really looking at how we can build personal and professional culture that respects diversity, inclusion, and equity. Uh, Karen, I see your hand is raised. Did you have a comment? Or were you just demonstrating? No, I saw somebody raise their hand. Okay. And I hit that to see if I could read her question. Okay. <laughs> Liz, what's going on? Okay, thank you. Perfect. Back to you, Katina. Sorry All right. about that. Know that you're fine. So we're going to be talking about the personal and professional journey as it relates to this work. We're also going to be defining diversity, inclusion, and equity. I think that uh, in our in a lot of our work, we have gotten away from what that truly looks like. Um, our current landscape has made diversity look like it's just about race. Granted, race is an element of diversity, but certainly not the only thing. There's the multi-layer um, approach as well. We're going to talk about the constructs and the implications of personal and professional bias. And then we're going to talk through some strategies to move this work through, um, to move this work forward in your organization. And then maybe some ways to get unstuck if you are currently stuck. I always like to begin every session uh, with creating working agreements that help us create a courageous space. When I did this work three, maybe four years ago, I used to say, you know what, we really need to create a safe space. But you know what, I am past that. 
we have to begin these conversations. These are courageous conversations. They may be uncomfortable conversations, and they're, but they're certainly necessary conversations. I know growing up in my home, my dad and mom always told me to not talk about race, religion, or politics right outside of the home. But guess what? We have to start talking about some of these things so that we can begin lifting barriers to inclusion and equity within our organizations. So we need to be courageous and begin these conversations uh, in our workplaces. We need to begin by asking ourselves, who do we need to be in the face of diversity, inclusion, and equity? And what does diversity, inclusion, and equity mean for us if, hey, maybe we don't look at race maybe or maybe we don't have the landscape or maybe we're not serving a population that is dealing with race but hey what other dimensions are there that we can be looking at so in developing these working agreements to create a courageous space we need to honor confidences in our workplaces when we begin these conversations remember mutual respect because not all of us are going to be at the same place when we're talking about diversity, inclusion, and equity. I may be further along than you, or you may be further along than me, but guess what? We can respect each other wherever we're at in our journey, give each other grace, and then remember that mutual respect. Accept unfinished business. This work is certainly a journey. It is going to be a journey that, hey, I'm on for the rest of my life. I'm going to be working to App to widen my worldview at every single angle and raising up a generation to do the same thing. I encourage you to stretch yourself as you do this work within your organizations so that you can grow. If you don't stretch, hey, you're not going to grow. I, I think about, um, oh, I'm sorry about that. I think about um, when I used to be a ballet dancer. If I didn't stretch, my muscles got tighter, right? But if I continued to stretch, I got longer. I got stronger in my journey. Invite humility while cultivating or curiosity. It's okay to ask those questions. Again, give grace where you need to, but certainly if you're not asking questions, then hey, you're not growing. And then of course, seek to expand your worldview. Many of us do the same thing every single day, right? We may go to our, we may drive the same way to work. Hey, we get to our offices. We drive the same way home. We, um, go to the same place of worship every week, or if not, um, or hey, you might be like me and you might be at home all day, right? With everything here. But still, there are still ways that you could expand your worldview even within your own bubble. So today's journey is going to put you on a personal and professional path. The personal journey is going to definitely be in parallel with your professional journey. As you begin growing and developing yourself and seeking to expand your worldview and understanding uh, diversity, inclusion, and equity, you're certainly going to grow that in your professional journey. Your, the barriers that you recognize within yourself might be barriers that you are putting up at your organization. And so, again, this journey is going to be an opportunity for you to learn about yourself and others. Certainly going to be ongoing, and it's going to be what you want to make it. I always stress this. It does not matter how you acted yesterday. It matters how you move forward. Once you see something, once you hear something, you cannot unsee it and you cannot unhear it. I encourage you all to forgive yourself for whatever joke you engaged in yesterday or last week, for whatever uh, statement you made, for whatever thing you put out in the atmosphere. It does not matter. That doesn't matter. What matters is moving forward differently, embracing new knowledge and taking that forward, taking that forward um, within yourself and then within your organization. So think about this. What are you looking forward to personally and professionally? What things do you need to dismantle within yourself? Did you have that parent or that grandparent who, um, who spewed isms at the dining room table? Are you having to interrogate some of those things right now in your head? I know I had to along my journey. I know the things that my grandfather said about other cultures and other folks with uh, uh, different gender identities or different sexual expressions than I had. I knew what I heard, but I had to, hey, study for myself and dismantle those things in my own head. 
So how I like to approach this work is by connecting the head, heart to the hand. And so when we're connecting our head to new information or to this information, we're taking it in. We're going to take it in and, hey, we may sit on it. We're, we may process it out. We may think about it a lot. We may research it afterwards, right? But then what we need to do is we need to connect it to our heart. So once we have the intellectual buy-in, now we need to reflect and personalize the information. That's called the emotional buy-in. Once we do those two things, then we can begin doing this work. I had to do this in my own work as being a practitioner in this work. I had to connect my head to it and do my research, connected it to my heart. And now I'm connected into my hands by teaching and by living and by being that social justice warrior that I need to be in this work. I encourage you all to jot some of these things down right here. This is something that you could take back to your organization. And when I'm doing this with organizations and working with organizations to really help them get unstuck in this work, I ask them two questions. I ask them, what do you hope by fully embracing diversity, inclusion, and equity at your organization? And then I also ask, what apprehensions are you holding? What's holding us back as an organization for truly embracing this work? What's holding us back? What conversations do we need to have as an organization that will advance this work for us? So I, I encourage you all to jot those two questions down and begin thinking about this. For those of you who are attending the mastermind session on next, on next Tuesday at three o'clock, we're going to unpack some of these things. We're going to talk about what are some of the things that might be holding your organization back in truly embracing this work? And then we're also going to talk through some of those apprehensions that you may be holding on to as well, that you may just need to ask a question about or get unstuck with. So as we look at this work and some of the guiding principles here, we truly have our own lens of how we see the world. And our lens was built up at a very young age. Our lens is attached to our value system. Our lens is attached to our parents and where we worshiped and if we worshiped or not and who our friends were and where our, what our community looked like. And if I grew up in an urban, urban population or if I grew up in a more rural population or if I had a diverse school that I went to, if I had a school that wasn't diverse or if I went to college in a, in a, in a more rural area or if I went to college in a, uh, in, a, in a less rural area, if I went to the military right? If I traveled overseas, if I did study abroad, if I grew up in poverty, or if I grew up in middle class, or if I grew up in wealth, all of those things are going to allow us to see, our, see the world and see the world very differently. And our lens on how we see the world is okay. Again, where we're at is where we're at. The goal is the journey. Being different is okay. And differences should certainly be valued. I, um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about me. I, uh, I grew up pretty middle class um, with two very hard working parents. And my parents sent us uh, in the beginning years of our life, they sent us to a pretty diverse school. We, with, we had kids from all, all walks of life around us. And we made friends with kids from all walks of life. But in the eighth grade, my parents decided to send us to Catholic schools where we then began, became the um, only two people of color in our class. We were Catholic during the week. We were Baptist on the weekends. We had friends from every walk of life, but we also had friends that didn't have a worldview that was widened like ours. And so we learned at a very young age that being different is okay. Being, uh, being who we were was okay. And having our worldview and, and having our worldview widen even wider, it was okay. Everyone holds some form of implicit bias. We'll talk about that here in a little bit. The more people know about their culture and the more they know about other cultures, the better communication will be. 
I, I tell this story quite a bit when I'm, I'm teaching these classes. And I have a coworker who, my goodness, grew up very differently than I did. And she, um, she I, I'm a person, I'm a woman of color, and she's not a woman of color. But we begin talking about our dogs and how we love our animals. We love our, we love our doggies. And we also love guacamole with lots of lime in it. We started our conversation on the things we had in common. We didn't start our conversation on the things that we didn't have in common. I'm a believer that societal difference is the sledgehammer that can break through anything. Or excuse, excuse me, I said that wrong. Human relationship is the sledgehammer that can break through any societal difference. Human relationship is the sledgehammer that can break through any societal difference. We just need to start somewhere. We have a responsibility to recognize and address power dynamics in our organizations to advance inclusion. Are our biases so strong that we're holding up barriers to uh, anyone else coming in our organization? Are our biases so strong against some or one or two or three different populations of people that we're putting up walls? What are we doing in our organizations? What middle class rules are we setting up in our organizations? What are those things that we're posing as barriers? Our mental models also are connected to our values. They're internal pictures of how the world works. And our mental models can be so strong that they can interfere with learning. Our mental models are deeply ingrained in our experiences and in our worldviews. Our mental models can be established and they can be established very strongly so and so strongly that they influence uh, who we surround ourselves with, where we eat, where we shop, where we decide to, uh, to buy a home at, where we decide to rent from, who we decide to do business with. They also get in the way and get in the way of how we interact and how we perceive one another and how we perceive one another. For instance, if my only circle of friends were women of color and I never let anyone else in that circle, where would I grab information about other people from? I would grab information about other people, maybe from the media, maybe from social, maybe from the news, news outlets or social media. And if that news is false, we're gonna begin building up generalizations about people or assumptions about people that may not be accurate. So I encourage you all, as you all are looking to learn this work, as you're looking to do this work authentically, suspend any negative mental models. I actually say suspend all your mental models so you can just let new learning come in. If you had a bias against, if you have a bias against a woman of color, you're not gonna learn anything from me tonight. You're not gonna learn one thing from me. So I encourage you all, in order to build these relationships that are significant, in order to reduce barriers in your organizations, and in order to grow along your personal and professional journeys, suspend mental models, your mental models of how you see the world. So some terminology I wanna go through tonight. Um, I want to begin by creating some consistent language around diversity, inclusion, and equity. I know there's a lot of terms flying out there. There was the, the buzzwords and lately we've made uh, diversity political and we really need to look at this thing a little bit differently. I say diversity is the who we are. Inclusion is how we're gonna leverage diversity. And then social equity is what we're going to do with the diversity and inclusion we have in our organizations. So in defining diversity, diversity says that this is the full spectrum of human differences and similarities that yield unique perspectives. It's everything about us, everything that we are. Yes, it's certainly our race. It's certainly our class and our gender. It's certainly our spiritual beliefs and our income levels and sexuality and our education, work experience, work style, if we've been in the military or not, organizational roles, it's all of that. It is all of that. It's that entire myriad that makes us so unique and so cool at the same time. 
So how do we do this in the workplace? How do we leverage? I apologize for clicking back and forth. I have a really sensitive mouse. So how do we leverage this in the workplace? We should be looking at our organization and we should be asking ourselves, what does diversity mean to us? What does diversity mean to us? What are our demographics? And are we serving who we should be serving? Based on that, I encourage you all in the workplace to employ individuals from diverse backgrounds, races, religions that represent who you should be serving, who you should be serving. Are you missing a population of people that you should be serving because of your own bias? Are you missing a population of people who you should be employing because of your own bias, because of rules that we've put up in our organizations? I encourage you all to eliminate all structures that perpetuate isms and bias. Have a no tolerance everything when it comes to this. Demonstrate meaningful representation in your publications and your media. What if you say to me, Katina, you know what? We don't serve a lot of people of color where we're at. Okay, so who do you serve, right? What is your demographic makeup? Who should you be serving? Do you have rural poverty? And you're missing an area of rural poverty because of maybe a bias? Review all job positions and descriptions to ensure that there are no barriers to hiring a diverse staff. This also speaks to equity. Are you making sure that your job postings um, are equitable? Understanding that maybe not everyone went to college, maybe understanding that some folks have very strong soft skills and maybe not the education. Do we require that bachelor's degree? What are, do we require direct deposit for all of our employees? Do we require our employees to have transportation? Do we require all employees to come to the job, or all prospective employees to come to the job uh, interview in a full suit and tie? Understanding that many people can't do that. And then developing recruitment and retention strategies to ensure diversity, to ensure diversity. Again, once you understand what diversity means for you, define that for yourself. Define that for your organization. What does diversity look, need to look like for our organization? And that's a courageous conversation that you all can have. Inclusion says that we value all individuals and we leverage their talent, not in spite of their differences, but because of them. We're gonna make sure that, hey, we see you as being different. We know that differences are okay. And we're gonna weave you into the fabric of the organization. We're going to hear you. We're going to listen to you. We're going to make sure that, hey, your voice is heard in an organization. Some of the worst uh, times that I've had in uh, serving on committees or serving on boards or even serving in previous roles in my job, some of the worst times that I've had is knowing that I've been called to a committee or ser to serve on a board or to serve in, on a group because I was a person of color. Because I was a person of color. So now I was just the face. My voice wasn't heard. Or if I did say something and someone else says something out, the very same thing that I said, their word was taken golden and mine was hushed. So make sure that you utilize the cool attributes that you have in your organization, leverage those and weave those into the organization's fabric. Understanding that everyone in your organization comes from a different place. Not every one of your employees come into your organization with college degrees. Not everyone came in to your organization holding an internship. You might have people in your organization right now who will never tell you that they grew up poor, or they may never tell you that they grew up with an addictive parent. They may never tell you that they're in an abusive situation right now, but they're in your organization and they're working for you right now and they just wanna be heard. They need to feel heard and they need to be included and woven in. Also, when we talk about this too, I like to talk about that generational gap as well. Making sure that, hey, you're listening to, that youth are listening to uh, some of the more traditional 
folks in the organization, the season ones and the season ones are doing the same. This says that we're going to include, this says, hey, you know what? We, no matter your age, I'm including you in to the fabric of the organization. Some systems that influence inclusion within the organization are flexible organizational structures. Just recently, in light of COVID, um, many of us had to begin working from home. And what that means is that, and what that meant for me, I'll use myself as an example, what that meant for me is that my daughter was also going to be home with me all day long as well. So I have a 10-year-old daughter who uh, does school upstairs and she dances downstairs. My organization understood this. So we revised our telework policy and removed the line item that said, hey, you know what, can be a caregiver during work hours. Our organization understood that, you know what, that might not be possible, right? Because when I have to take lunch, my, when my daughter has to take lunch, I have to take lunch too. Sometimes my work schedule means that I'm working on Sunday afternoon or Saturday mornings, right? So in this, this, uh, this allowed me, this allows me to be at my best because I know I have a flexible work structure. Transparent communications also are highly important when we're talking about inclusion, right? Being able to understand and know uh, what people are saying, being able to have effective communication where no one gets confused by what other people are saying, uh, by understanding what our job roles are, these are so important. Work-life balance. Also, very important. I know what I just said didn't sound like work-life balance, but I believe me, it is. <laughs> but certainly, it is something that uh, influences inclusion. Your recruitment and selection processes, how you select your uh, prospective employees, how you select board members in the organization, that is going to certainly be an inclusive process. And that might be something where you ask folks from the community or put out your job posting somewhere in a, a non-traditional place, right? Leadership accountability certainly influences inclusion. We have uh, an environment at Nonprofit Network where I can have a conversation with my boss and I could say, hey, you know what? Something isn't right here. We need to do something differently. I can hold her accountable. And she respects that about me. Inclusion. Performance management, certainly. Mentoring and coaching, I'm gonna stay here for a minute. Mentoring and coach, coaching says that we recognize that, that not all of our employees had the same experience coming into the organization. And that some employees may need a little bit more mentoring and coaching than others. And this is where grace can be given. Grace can be given, but make sure you're also doing the coaching and not just the yelping, right? And not just telling on everyone because sometimes people just don't know what they don't know, right? And so let's coach, let's, let's, let's do what we need to do. I um, just recently, we recently um, had, a, had a brand new coworker come in and I know she wouldn't mind me sharing this story, but she came in and um, her nails were really, really long. And this is, and, and the job that, uh, that we have is, is a computer job. So, well, for her job, it was a lot of data entry, a lot, a lot of those things in the, in the workplace. And so we could have talked about her nails. We could have talked about her. We could have said, I can't believe she did this. But you know what? We were her second job from college. The job she had before she came to Nonprofit Network allowed her to have those nails because she didn't do the work, didn't do the data entry work that we do now. But guess what? We were able to coach her and say, you know what, sister girl, you might want to cut those nails out a little bit just so that you could type. And guess what? She did. Now she understands that every time she goes to get her nails done now, hey, they're short enough so that she can type. Mentoring and coaching. Not everyone has had the home training we did. Not everyone came from that same work ethic and background that we did. So hey, coach them. Team-based business processes is certainly a big thing to influence inclusion, where teams make decisions together. That's so cool, right? And then continuous learning, making sure that folks have professional development opportunities to get stronger and better in their work. So now I want to talk about uh, equality versus equity. I'm sorry for jumping around so much. Equality represents that everyone is at the same level 
and that everyone needs the same thing, right? So as we look, in the, uh, look at the photo here, we see that doesn't work for everyone. If we give everyone the same thing, it just doesn't work, right? Equity says that we are going to provide justice and fairness. We understand the diverse and unique individuality of each person. We're gonna meet folks where they are. We're not gonna give them sameness. I love this slide. So now as we look to advance equity in the workplace, it begins with looking through the equity lens. At Nonprofit Network, we have the opportunity to go to organizations and do what we call equity audits. And with the equity audit, we look through marketing materials and handbooks to just see if there's any barriers to access for anyone coming into your organization or anyone who is currently in your organization. We look at handbooks, policies, procedures, uh, hours of operation, marketing materials. We do those things. We also look through uh, job postings and descriptions. You don't have to call us in to do that, but this is certainly something that you all can do, right? Equity in the or equity in the workplace says that we are not giving everyone sameness, but we're going to meet people where they're at. Again, I mentioned earlier that some of the barriers to equity in the workplace is requiring things that are that may not work for everyone in the organization. So just thinking about that as we are moving through our work and in our organizations. So now I want to add, but sorry for jumping back and forth. So now I want to talk through trust and bias. Trust and bias are certainly related. I'm actually going to get all of these up here for us. Okay. Trust and bias are related. The less we trust someone, the more bias we have for that person or towards that person. The less we trust, the more bias we can form, excuse me, we can form for that person or people. I want us to test it. I want us on a piece of paper to jot down three, two to three folks you go to when you need advice that are outside of family. Go ahead and jot those things down, jot that down. Two to three people you go to outside of family that you need, that you, that you go to for advice. Next to those two to three people, I want you to jot down their approximate age. Next to their age, I want you to jot down their socio, economic status, so whether they are in poverty, middle class, or wealth. Then I want you to jot next to their, uh, their um, socioeconomic status, their gender identity, male, female, transgender. Next to that, jot down their sexual identity. LGBTQIA, lesbian, gay, bisexual, intersexual. And then next to that, jot down the race. Now I want you to take a look at your list. Take a look at your list. And if your list reflects people that are like you or most like you, your bias may be stronger toward other individuals than not. Again, when we have people in our pocket that we go to for advice that are so much like us, we're not getting any other information or any different information poured into us. We're hearing from people who are like us. And so what we do unintentionally, right, unintentionally, is we pour in assumptions and we may pour in stereotypes. We may pour in judgment about a group of people that may not be like us. So when trust declines, bias can certainly increase. 
when trust increases, bias can decrease, right? So I want us to begin asking ourselves when we are when we do feel something that comes up for us. I want us to check in on that and ask ourselves, why is that coming up for me? Why am I fearful when I'm in a certain neighborhood and I feel like I got to lock my door? Why am I fearful when someone comes up next to me? I feel like I need to grab my purse. Why am I fearful when someone comes up to me with a different identity and I have to kind of give them that side eye look? Why do I do that, right? Check in on those things for yourself. And this is how we are going to begin our journey. Begin our journey. If we're not already there. And you know what, you all, as a pr practitioner in this work, sometimes these things come up for me. And I have to check myself and say, you know what, why is that coming up for me right now? I'm this warrior, right? I'm doing this work all the time. But why is this coming up for me right now? I have to always and constantly self-monitor that so that I can break that down, interrogate that, and throw that out the door. Again, it doesn't matter how you acted yesterday. It matters how you move forward and moving forward differently is important, okay? Once we see it, we can't unsee it. The way we see the world is connected to our mental models. Again, no trust means no relationship. No trust means no relationship, no relationship across lines of difference. And remember, human relationship is the sledgehammer that can break down any societal difference. So as we dive more into unconscious bias, unconscious bias just says that these are our natural people preferences. We have, all of us have natural people preferences, right? I like people who act like me, right? We, we like our people who act like us, right? Who we kind of kiki with and just do our thing with, right? And we certainly are biologically hardwired to prefer people who look like us and sound like us and share our interests, right? So this is why and how we get linked up with people so much like us, right? But simply put, as we move down to the last bullet, our neurology takes us to the very brink of bias and certainly poor decision making. Again, if you have a bias that is so strong, you may be a barrier in your own organization. If you have a personal bias that is so strong, you might be a barrier in your own organization. So check in on that, figure out what that is, and work to change it. There are several types of bias here that we could talk about. Affinity bias says that we have a tendency to warm up people like ourselves, as I just mentioned. The halo effect is the tendency to think everything about a person is good because you like them. That's the halo effect. You're like, oh my gosh, they're an angel, so I like them. So I'm gonna cling to them because I like them. It doesn't matter what they say or what they talk about, but I like them and I'm just gonna hang on to them, right? Perception bias is a tendency to form stereotypes and assumptions about groups of people that make it impossible to make an objective judgment about members of those groups, right? If we form such strong assumptions about people and we don't get out of our bubble to interrogate that and to change that and to dismantle that, then we're gonna be stuck in that system and we're gonna continue to make those judgments. So again, our goal is to educate ourselves and get outside of our bubbles. And we can educate ourselves by going on, we can go on a, um, equity journeys, we could go, we could read books, we can seek to get unstuck, we could do a book club at our organization. We could say, you know what, this month is Black History Month. Hey, let's do something. We know um, we have Women's History Month coming up. We have, right, we have all the months coming up. We could do a month, right? But the goal is to educate yourself. Educate yourself about different races, about different socioeconomic um, levels of inequity, uh, about different gender identities and sexual identities. Educate yourself about the world. Confirmation bias, this is really, really scary bias. This is a tendency for people to seek out information that confirms pre-existing beliefs or assumptions, right? You have a bias that's so strong that you said, you know what, I'm going to confirm this thing and I'm going to grab pictures and articles and videos and I'm going to, right, to confirm it. 
And then group think is another thing I want us to get away from in our organizations. Group think really shuts down organizations and boards. It's where everyone sits around the table and they all nod their head yes, right? No one wants to put up, no one wants to have conflict. No one wants to have a different idea or express an opinion. Everyone is group thinking. Same, that's scary. And when, we're, when our organizations begin to do this, we may need to mix up the landscape, right? That's why term limits are so important on boards because when we are together for a long time or if we've been a board that's been together for 10 years, 15 years, we're all thinking alike. We need to get someone else in there that's going to help us think a little bit differently. The impacts of bias certainly can be personal and professional. I want you all right now to jot down some of the impacts of personal bias and jot down some of the impacts of bias in the workplace. I'll give you a couple of seconds to do this. Again, if you are in uh, the mastermind with us next week, we're going to have a little bit more conversation around this as well. I'm really looking forward to that. So now, in changing your biases and changing your own personal biases, because again, remember, we're coming up on two lenses, the personal journey and the professional journey. And remember, our personal journey is going to spill into our professional journey. It's going to spill into what we do in the community. It's going to spill into how we raise our kids. It's going to spill in to where we move, right? What if our kids bring home someone that don't look like them or may not act like them? How, what are we going to say to our own children? What cycles are we going to perpetuate within our own family? We have to break some stuff. I had to break some stuff with myself. My goodness, I had my, my, my parents, I didn't grow up with the, the parents that, that were just social justice warriors, right? I grew up with folks who poured things into me where I look at it now and I'm like, oh, ew, ooh, ooh. I really had to ter interrogate that, right? Really had to dismantle that thought process. So in changing your own biases, seek to understand them. Seek to understand your bias and why things come up for you, or why when you're watching a television show and something gets uncomfortable for you, why you're changing that so fast, right? Or why when you read something in the newspaper, you're like, oh, yep, that's it, I knew it. Seek to understand why you're thinking like that. Then consider why you might be hanging on to it. Why are you hanging on to a certain bias? One way that I um, proved I, one way that I had to dismantle some of this stuff was by proving it wrong. I had to prove it wrong by educating myself, by engaging with people who were different than me, um, by going to different meetings and learning about different experiences of people. I committed to experiencing individuals and not groups, right? Because sometimes we could generalize groups and not think about individuals at the same time. Continue to make connections with others. That's the only way we're going to learn and grow. Networking opportunities are so important. If you all have an opportunity to engage in, in peer discussion or networking opportunities, and while many of us are on Zoom, hey, join a Zoom group with folks that don't look like you or act like you or are not doing the same thing you're doing. We have such a cool opportunity now with technology that we could do these things and do it differently and ask questions of others and just sit back and engage and listen, experience. And then openly discuss your experiences but with bias um, with others. Have a courageous org conversation at your organization. Think about some of the things that may be holding your organization back. You might even ask yourselves, hey, you guys, what biases might we be holding on to that keep us stuck within our organization? And then encourage others to talk about their experiences. Level the playing field. Say, you know what, there's no rank in the room today. Take that CEO role off your, off your head, that vice president, take that off and say, you know what, there's no rank in the room today. We're going to have a conversation. 
We're going to conversate, we're going to have a conversation that says, who do we need to be as an organization? Who do we need to be as individuals to get out of our own way? And then as we begin uh, creating our workplace structures to eliminate bias, we can conduct anonymous employee surveys. So uh, contact those um, employees or contact your current employees to talk about this, right? Do an anonymous survey. Some folks are saying, you know what, I don't like taking surveys because they're gonna find my IP address. Figure out a way, right? Figure out a way. I like doing, um, I encourage organizations to do what I call stay interviews. And what stay interviews are, is there um, an opportunity for the board chair to take the executive director out and have a conversation, or for the executive director in the organization to take each one of their employees somewhere, or do something on Zoom. It's not a, per, it's not a performance evaluation, but it's a stay interview. You're going to ask your employees, why do they stay? Why do they come to work every day? A lot of the times we do these exit interviews and we wait until folks are getting ready to leave or put their two weeks in to ask them, why are they leaving? And then we get all these issues, right? Then they tell us all of these things that we could have addressed when they were there, right? So conduct these stay interviews or do these anonymous surveys. You could also survey former employees to learn about what their experience was at your organization. Google yourself to see what people are saying about your organization, right? And then certainly you can uh, conduct an organizational diversity audit or team up with a consultant to help you do this so that you can root out some of those issues within your organization or whatever barriers you might have in your organizations. And then ultimately, we want to create workplace structures to build team, right? Make sure we're meeting people where they are. We all grew up differently. We saw all those spectrum, the, the, that spectrum of diversity, those un, that unique blend that we all bring to the table, that multi-layer and the intersectionality when it comes to all of our different uh, identities. We have so much stuff that we have in our back pocket, right? We all grew up differently. We all have a different worldview. We all have intersectionality. Eliminate all drama, get rid of it. Let's focus on the mission of our organizations. Let's move the work forward. We're doing really important work. We're, we're, we have, we're, we're saving lives, we're training and teaching. Let's do mission work. Let's do mission work and make sure that we're serving people who we should be serving, who we should be serving. Recognize power dynamics in the organization and eliminate them. Power dynamics can even show up in the way we um, in the way we design our meeting spaces, right? Do we always have the two pe the two leaders sit at the top of the table every single meeting? And what does that do? That diminishes everyone else. Round those round those meeting tables out, rotate meeting leaders at staff meeting, right? Executive directors, you don't always have to lead your staff meeting. We rotate our meetings, right? Every meeting, we rotate our meetings. Think about ways in which we can eliminate those power dynamics. Because when we have power dynamics in our organizations, folks are gonna be less transparent in their communications with us. We're not gonna begin these conversations. We're not gonna move this work forward. We really have to recognize where the power is. And it's okay to have power and privilege. It is okay, I'm not saying it's not, but I'm just saying, recognize it and figure it out. Communicate effectively is certainly gonna be an, a very important thing when we talk about um, building team within our organizations. Meet regularly, and you could do this on Zoom. We have our, I, we meet with our staff meets every week and I have always have a one-on-one -on -one with each one of my team members. We're a small team, but I meet with my team members. We all have a day, a standard day that we, we get together and chat. We meet as a team every week. So we meet regularly and we have difficult conversations. And our, our conversations are difficult, but guess what? We can walk away knowing that we've made progress. Constantly self-monitor, constantly self-monitor. Ask yourself, why is something coming up for us? Why is something coming up for the team? Why, is, why, why, why are we doing the same thing? So self-monitor, and group monitor and hold each other accountable respectfully. Pull your coworkers to the side if they said something that was adverse, right? Have that conversation with them. Doesn't matter how you acted yesterday. It matters how you move forward. 
It matters how you move forward. And some things are going to trigger us and we may need to have hard conversations. Have those hard conversations. Don't keep those in. This is the only way we can move our organizations forward. So now, seek to change the culture. Jot down your action items. What are some of the things that as an organization you need to do? What are some of the things that as an individual you need to do? My action items are constantly long. I'm constantly catching myself doing or saying something, but I'm giving myself grace. I'll give you grace. You give me grace, right? We give our coworkers grace. So jot down your action items. Uh, next week, my uh, mastermind group will have conversation around this and we'll talk through some of your action items, uh, some of the things that you may thought about as you're thinking about um, the intellectual buy-in and even the emotional buy-in that you might be having right now, and then um, how we want to push this work forward in our organizations. So now I promised you 10 minutes <laughs> for question and answer. So we'll move there. And so we'll do that at this moment. Thank you so much, Katina. That was delightful, mm -hmm. uh, mind-blowing at times, mm -hmm. very thought-provoking. Uh, took my breath away a couple of times mm -hmm. where, but I also chuckled several. So <laughs> nice balance there. And um, yeah, we've got some time, folks. So <laughs> I know it was a lot to absorb mm -hmm. and a lot to think about, but mm -hmm. oh, we got something here. They okay. come. Even provide feedback. If you have a comment, please also throw that in there as well. Okay, Katina, um, Monica is asking if it is okay to share this information once it is available on the website. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank yes. Thank you. And I know one thing that crossed my mind is how boring life would be if we were all the same. Yes, right. <laughs> You're the only one who gets to be you. I'm the only one right? who gets to be me. And to look at it from a, I get to be me, yes. you know, and um, that we all should, you yes. know, I think if we start by looking at ourselves mm -hmm. as magical and sacred and yes. spectacular, and like the forgiveness pieces. Yes. Oh. I knew that a year mm -hmm. ago was like, we are going to have to be very forgiving of each mm -hmm. other because nobody knows what we're dealing with right, right now. Right. Okay, let's see. I don't have a question. Just wanted to say that you have given me a lot to think about. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That was from one of our board members. Wonderful. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, Freddie Sims, who is the ED of Social Justice for Us, Katina, asked, any tips for a new upcoming group how can we make sure mm -hmm. our recruiting process is inclusive? How can we encourage others to lead the coaching and mm -hmm. mentoring you're speaking of? So as we look at, um, and, and actually, is that question up so I can, because I know that was two part. Yes, it's, oh. it's in the Q&A. Okay. Freddie Sims. Oh, perfect. I see you, Freddie. All right. How can we make our, make sure Make sure that you are inviting folks uh, to your to that process. And actually, it does not matter um, if they are an employee or not. If you want to create an ad hoc DEI group that uh, looks at your recruitment process, you can certainly do that. I have uh, facilitated many of those groups um, and getting those different ideas. You can bounce things off of me, Freddie. We... <laughs> You can certainly email me um, to, to get some of those tips. I have um, recruitment strategies and some recruitment tips that I could share with you as well. And then encouraging others to lead. Um, that is one thing that um, was very difficult for me in the beginning. I didn't feel like I was a leader. So sometimes we have to make sure that we make others feel that they are leaders as well. And so um, once we begin doing that, it'll be easier and easier for them. Start delegating more to folks and start trusting folks with more and different information, right? So that they can feel like a leader in the organization and so that they can feel um, free to coach and mentor others. 
Thank you, Katina. You're I uh, have another comment. I really enjoyed this and I am taking a lot away from it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And then we have Taylor asking, mm -hmm. can you talk more about the inclusive environment system of recruitment and selection processes? Absolutely. How can we do this best? Absolutely. This is looking for, um, and actually posting your job, post things differently, right? or um, seeking different avenues. A lot of people like to push the easy button and post their jobs on Indeed or post um, their, their board positions in very similar avenues. What I would recommend you do is think about um, Michigan Nonprofit Association, posting jobs there, um, utilizing us at Nonprofit Network. We could post jobs or post um, uh, prospective board positions there. Thinking about um, increasing your sphere of influence so that you have different pockets of people where you can send um, send things to like job positions or board postings, things like that. So seek to increase your, your sphere of influence or even um, reaching out to capacity builders like Grow and Lead or Nonprofit Network and saying, hey, guys, do you have or do you know of anyone who might be interested in dot, dot, dot? I get several emails and I'm always kind of sending them around different places. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. um, Liz Seafelt over in Ashland, Wisconsin, way up north, is uh, says she. I struggle with finding qualified applicants who have the job skills mm -hmm. that come from a minority demographic. Mm -hmm. My organization is in an economically depressed area, and frigate flight from mm -hmm. all the demographics is common. Mm -hmm. So the term qualified, so that might be a biased term. Um, I don't, I don't, I don't mean to say that in a very negative connotation, but sometimes what we, what we're looking at, we're looking at the wrong things. We hire for soft skills and hire for the hard skills, right? Understanding that not everyone is going to come from a same, from the same or similar background, right? And we also look at the term fit. And fit is another word that um, says that we need to find somebody that's going to look like us and act like us. And that might, that might not be the right person for us. So if you have a, if, if this job is a technical job that you need to have the, the certifications, you need to have all of those things, right? I can see that, but are there any ways in which folks can get in your organization and get on the job training or get in the door and then they could get certified while under your wings? What are some other ways in which we could get people in our organizations and then make sure that they're successful? Is there a policy we might need to amend um, that we've had for 10 years that says that all employees need to have dot, 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 right? And so that's where that equity audit is going to come into play with you looking at your policies and procedures and saying, yep, you know what? We might need to change some things. Thank you. Liz, hopefully you'll join us next week on the member mastermind. Absolutely. And have um, awesome. given this some thought. Uh, JC has a question regarding representation and the largely white population mm -hmm. up here. Mm -hmm. I believe as of the 2019 census, it was over 90% in mm -hmm. Market County. Mm -hmm. With that being said, it can sometimes be hard mm -hmm. to fill boards mm -hmm. with an adequately diverse group of people and mm -hmm. representation. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and that's um, going back to understanding that you have to define diversity for yourself within your organization. If you don't serve a large uh, group or if there's if there's not many people of color in your community, where are some other areas that you can look? Do you serve um, folks from rural poverty? Do you serve a large LG LGBTQI community? Do you serve folks with disabilities? Do you serve a different dim um, makeup? So understanding your demographic makeup in your community is gonna be very important and making sure that you define diversity for yourself as an organization. Okay, well, we're coming up on 7 p.m. and I think we've hit on all the questions. Sorry about the way I read that, Liz. <laughs> and Liz did mention that when she put qualified, she did have it in quotes. Oh, oh got it. You okay. know that. So um, I'm happy to be able to share got it. that. And 
So, yeah, I think that we're going to let you take a breath, Katina, yeah. and um, have a nice evening with Gabrielle. Yes. And um, thank you. And I can't wait for next week. I can't and either. I am so delighted to have made a new friend this week and um, learned so much tonight and have a lot to think about. Mm. And thank you, the rest of you, for joining us. I'm sure I'm going to see that little number of participants going down soon. You know how to reach us. Email. Uh, I think yours is on the slide. We will be sending information out, and this is being recorded. Somebody did mention that everyone should attend this. So thank you so much, Katina, for allowing us to make it available to everyone. Yes. Thanks, everyone. We really appreciate yes. everything. I hope you're getting thank yous and yeses and <laughs> ooh, ooh, oh. I give you the cheering. <laughs> Yay. Thanks, guys. I can't wait to see you all next week. I cannot wait to continue this conversation. Have a great evening. All right. All right. Bye.